endocrine system. The endocrine system doesn't react as fast as the nervous system because it's not using electrical impulses, right? It's going to be using hormones. So in general, when we think about the endocrine system, I want you to think about control of metabolism, about control of stress, and control of reproduction. Okay? Metabolism, stress, reproduction, controlled by the endocrine system. If we're going to talk about the endocrine system, we have to talk about hormones. And when we look at hormones, it turns out that they fit into, these chemicals fit into a, a few general categories. They're either steroids, amino acids, polypeptides, or glycoproteins. Okay? So these are going to be the kinds of chemicals that can act as hormones. We have to be careful when we're doing the endocrine system and thinking about hormones uh, in terms of what we actually call a hormone. And when we're talking about hormones, what we want to make sure the, that the chemical fits uh, is that it's released from specific tissues and has specific target organs. Okay? So it has to be released from specific tissues and has specific target organs. So I, I can tell you a chemical that has amazingly uh, widespread actions on the body. It would cause things like increased respiration, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, it increased mental activity. It does all kinds of these things. You think, gosh, that just sounds like something that might be a hormone. I'm talking about carbon dioxide, right? That, that has all kinds of, of effects on the body. Well, does it fit our definition of a hormone? Release from specific tissues, targeting specific tissues. No, right? And so that's why we have a relatively narrow area that we can look at when we're talking about hormones. So again, they're going to tend to be steroids, amino acids, polypeptides, or, or glycoproteins. If we look at mechanisms of actions, what we'll find is that the hormones are going to change activities of cells where the activity already exists, but we can speed it up or slow it down. And so it's going to change the activities of cells by speeding up or slowing down mechanisms that are already in the, the cells. Let's take a look first at how protein hormones and proteinaceous hormones, so the amino acids, the polypeptides, the glycoproteins, kind of things, how those work, and then we'll take a look at the steroids in, in a special case in a minute. So it turns out that the protein-like hormones can't go through the cell membrane. We knew that, right? They can't get through the cell membrane. So instead, they're going to attach to receptors that are on the target tissues. When those hormones, the protein hormones, attach to those receptors, they're going to cause those receptors to release G proteins. G, I wonder when we've heard this before. <laughs> right? So it, it's acting like kind of like a transmitter, right? Uh, the indirect transmitter. So they attach to these receptors that are on the, the, the target tissues, cause the release of G proteins. The G proteins are going to stimulate an enzyme that's in the cell membrane called adenylate cyclase. And for some reason, when they made this PowerPoint, they decided to break the word cyclase up, put some of it in there. So. Sorry about that, I didn't make the PowerPoint. So there's a word, adenylate cyclase. That enzyme, adenylate cyclase, changes ATP into cyclic AMP. What a surprise, it takes two phosphates off. Make sense? Cyclic adenosine monophosphate, AMP. Once that enzyme changes ATP into cyclic AMP, the cyclic AMP is able to remove this inhibitory subunit and turn a protein kinase from its inactive form into its active form. And we've talked about protein kinase a little bit before, right? And so these are enzymes that cause specific actions inside the cells, and the cyclic AMP then 
is able to remove this inhibitory subunit and allow this protein kinase to become active. Once the protein kinase becomes active, it can turn on or off specific enzymes in the cell. And it turns out it does it by uh, phosphorylation of proteins. I don't really care that you know that. But it's going to activate or inactivate specific enzymes. Because cyclic AMP is allowing the message to, a, to be transferred into the cell, we call cyclic AMP a second messenger. Okay? So we're going to call cyclic AMP a second messenger for the hormone protein. Right? This, this protein-like hormone. A uh, silly analogy here, folks, but you know, the, maybe the uh, FedEx guy shows up at your, door, at your door and says, you know, I've got a special letter for, and it's at my house, right? So my wife answers, I got a special letter for Gary Fuller. And my wife says, well, can I sign? And uh, he says, no, uh, Gary has to sign. So my wife comes and gets me so that I'll come to the door and sign. So my wife became the second messenger. The cyclic AMP. So the hormone can't get in, but it can use the second messenger, cyclic AMP, to activate the protein kinase and cause the action change inside the cell. So this is how protein hormones work. Okay? They use a receptor using G proteins and, and cyclic uh, AMP. When we look at how steroid hormones work, it hopefully won't surprise you <laughs> to learn that steroid hormones can pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Right? Like dissolves like. So very commonly steroid hormones have carrier proteins in the plasma. We don't really care so much about that. The hormones can pass through the fluid mosaic model, right, the cell membrane. They get into the cell where there's a receptor protein, and the receptor protein will transport that steroid hormone into the nucleus where the receptor protein can bind to the DNA, and it changes transcription rates. We know that, right? That if you change transcription rates, what do you get? Protein synthesis changes in the cell. So speeding up, slowing down, whatever is going to occur in the cell because the steroid hormone actually affects your DNA. Right? It's going to go in and change transcription rates on your DNA. What is it going to A receptor protein. And then that receptor protein and the hormone together bind to DNA. All right, so that's action of a steroid hormone. We had action of a protein hormone. And then here's the Kind of blend, if you will. You have a hormone called thyroxin. By the way, it can be spelled with or without the E. You'll see it's spelled both ways. And thyroxin, <coughs> even though it really is protein-like, we'll find out how in a few minutes, works like a steroid hormone. So it turns out that what you call thyroxin is actually called T4. We'll find out why in a minute. And T4 can cross the cell membrane. It gets into the cell where it's picked up by a binding protein. It's changed into its active form that we're going to call T3. This will make more sense in a minute, a few minutes. T3 can then actually go into the cell uh, into the, excuse me, into the nucleus where it binds to a receptor protein in there and T3 and the receptor protein bind to DNA. So thyroxin acts kind of like a steroid, all right? So in that the end product, the T3, is going to go into the nucleus and bind to DNA and cause the change inside the cell, change transcription rates. So even though it's really protein-like, it acts like a steroid. And we'll do thyroid the thyroxin in, in a little bit, uh, and, and it'll make a lot more sense when we do that. All right, so let's take a look at the different organs involved in the endocrine system. The first organ that I have in the endocrine system is the, what, hypothalamus? Holy, I thought, isn't the hypothalamus part of the nervous system? I think I'm confused. 
Here's the problem, folks. Nobody ever told your body that it was gonna be divided up into systems, <laughs> right? We divide the body into systems to try to help us understand how it works, right? So we divide it up and then we can make each system do different things. But there's no division, the body is just one body. And here's an area of complete overlap of the nervous system and the endocrine system. Uh, so the, one of the major controllers, right, of the body, the nervous system, actually joins with the endocrine system. This is that interface where both are working together. And when this was first discovered, it was really exciting to find this place where the endocrine ner uh, and nervous systems come together, where we had this, this interface. Uh, so it's not just by chance that the hypothalamus sits right above the pituitary. Right? That's not just by chance that that happens. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary both by nerves and by blood vessels. Okay? By nerves and by blood vessels. Turns out the nerves are really going to go primarily to the posterior pituitary and the blood vessels are going to go to the anterior pituitary. So your pituitary gland is sometimes called the master gland of the endocrine system. Okay? It was named early on, the master gland. It wasn't until much later that they discovered that the pituitary gland is actually controlled by the hypothalamus. So the master gland has a master. The real master is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces hormones that can control pituitary. Let's take a look. So here's a table that's trying to show the hormones that are going to be released from the anterior pituitary, which we're going to get to in just a minute. And the hormones that are released from the hypothalamus that actually control the anterior pituitary. And not too surprisingly, because they control the hormones that are coming out of the hypothalamus, or of the anterior pituitary, for the most part, they call them either releasing or inhibitory hormones. Okay. So let's look at them. A hormone from the hypothalamus that's called thyrotropin releasing hormone. What's it do? It causes thyrotropin in the anterior pituitary to be released. Another name for thyrotropin is thyroid stimulating hormone. That'll make more sense in a minute. A hormone called prolactin releasing hormone. What's it gonna cause the anterior pituitary to release? Prolactin. Well, what about one called prolactin release inhibitory hormone? It's gonna stop the release of prolactin. A hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone. It's going to cause the release of adrenocortical hormone. A hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's going to cause the release of two gonadotropins, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Growth hormone releasing hormone. I wonder what that one does. Causes a release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. And then here's the only one where they really try to confuse us. Instead of calling the inhibitory hormone for growth hormone, growth hormone release inhibitory hormone, they called it somatostatin. Soma refers to the body, statin means to stop. So it's stopping the growth of the body. All right, so the inhibitory hormone is called somatostatin. It affects growth hormone, stops the release. <coughs> So when this was first discovered, folks, as I said, it was really, really exciting. Um, you know, the, when, when they did this, these studies, they actually set up the labs uh, next to a slaughterhouse for pigs. And so when they would slaughter pigs, they would go in and say, can we have their brains? Right? And so they would pull out the brains in the anterior pituitary, and then they went in and started pulling out the hypothalamus and checking for minute levels of these hormones, and they were able to, to find them. Uh, again, uh, amazing right? research and, and an amazing link between the nervous system 
and the endocrine system. Um, some of these just for a minute. We're going to come back and go through each of these hormones in the anterior pituitary. But think about this gonadotropin releasing hormone. You learned about these gonadotropins in anatomy, luteinizing hormone, right, that causes ovulation in the female. It turns out it also causes release of testosterone in the male. We'll come back to that in a minute. Follicle stimulating hormone uh, causes ovulation, right? Uh, excuse me, not ovulation, but development of the follicles. Uh, and uh, development of sperm in the males. So I'm telling you that the nervous system controls the endocrine system, which controls your gonads. Right? So I want to take you back to a very painful time in your lives. I want you to go back to high school uh, and think about the really big dance. Right? It was the senior prom, maybe it was ball, I don't know. It was a, a really, really big dance. And you had to have, right, it was all kinds of stress because for the girls, you had to get the right dress, the right shoes. For the guys, we just had to go to the tuck shop. But nevertheless, right, you had to, right, we wanted everything to be just the way it was supposed to be. Perfect date. You had this really big date coming up. Two days before the really big dance, a giant pimple breaks out on your nose. Do you think that was just chance? The giant pimple jumped out two days before the dance. It wasn't chance, folks. The stress of the really big dance stimulated your hypothalamus, which stimulated the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which stimulated the release of hormones from your gonads and caused you to break out. Uh, another classic example would be the woman who is concerned that she might be pregnant. She doesn't want to be pregnant. She's concerned that she might be pregnant and her period is two weeks too late. All right, so it's two weeks late and then all of a sudden she has her period. So why did I have, what? you know, two weeks I was stressing, right? Why did it have to be right now that I was stressing so bad and I didn't have my period on time? You think that was just chance? No, it wasn't chance. Nervous system controls the anterior pituitary, controls the gonads, right? This is a really important interface uh, where these, these two come together. All right, so let's take a look at your pituitary gland, the master gland. Yes? Could you do the opposite as well? Could it force it to, to come earlier? Uh, it changes levels of hormones. So depending on what's going on, between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, you could certainly cause changes. And all of these different things can be affected. So another name for the pituitary gland is the hypothesis. Right? It's also called the hypothesis. I don't know where you folks are going in your careers. You need to learn both names. Right? It's just the way that it works. The pituitary is actually really two separate glands. They, they derive actually from separate uh, germ tissues. And so it's really two separate glands. An anterior portion that is glandular, and we call it the adenohypothesis or the anterior pituitary. Adeno means glandular. Okay? So the adenohypothesis is also called the anterior pituitary, shown here. The posterior pituitary is derived from nerve tissue, and we call it the neurohypothesis. Okay? So we have the adenohypothesis and the neurohypothesis. They are connected to the hypothalamus through an area, a little stock area here that we call the infundibulum. So that area right there is called the infundibulum. It's a little stock that connects the two. It, it's, I'm sorry, it connects the they both, the neuro and, and deno hypothesis are connected to the hypothalamus by this little stock area okay, called the infundibulum. Oh, I can try. No, it's not on there. So, I think that's right. That's right. All right. Uh, anterior pituitary. We're going to look at six major hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary. Okay. Six major hormones. 
The first hormone is a hormone called thyrotropin. It's also called thyroid stimulating hormone. You need to learn these, these synonyms, folks. I don't know where you're going in your careers, right? And so somewhere someone's gonna call it thyroid stimulating hormone, someone else is gonna call it thyrotropin. You need to know both terms. Troph means to feed or to nourish. And so here's a hormone that they call thyrotropin. Guess what it does to your thyroid gland? It feeds or nourishes, right? So it's gonna stimulate the thyroid gland to enlarge and become more active. Thyrotropin okay. stimulates the thyroid gland to enlarge and become more active. So the diagram is trying to, to show you that. A hormone that's a mouthful, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Adrenocorticotrophic hormone often abbreviated as ACTH, sometimes called corticotropin for short. So it's going to feed what? The adrenal cortex. Right? It feeds or nourishes the adrenal cortex. So you recall that the adrenal cortex is the outside of the adrenal gland. Right? So adren adrenal corticotrophic hormone. The gonadotrophic hormones. Follicle stimulating hormone. Okay. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicles to develop in females. Follicles talking about the immature ovum and its surrounding cells in the ovary. Okay. So it causes those follicles to develop. As the follicles develop, they release estrogens and progesterone. So it stimulates follicles to develop, but releasing also then estrogens and progesterone. In males, follicle stimulating hormone really has the same effect. It stimulates sperm production. Do you see that it's really the same effect? Yeah. Stimulating the testes to produce sperm, stimulating the ovaries to produce ova. The other gonadotropin is one called luteinizing hormone oftentimes called LH. When we get to the reproductive system, we're gonna find out that when ovulation occurs, when the follicle ruptures, what's left behind is called the corpus luteum. What's corpus mean? Body, it's yellow, and the term luteum means yellow. So this is the yellowing hormone. That's why they called it luteinizing hormone. So it causes ovulation in the female. In males, it stimulates specialized cells called the interstitial cells of the testes to produce testosterone. It stimulates interstitial cells to produce testosterone. Because it stimulates interstitial cells, they gave it another name. It's also called interstitial cell stimulating hormone, ICSH. So ICSH is also called luteinizing hormone, interstitial cell stimulating hormone. Prolactin, pretty easy to figure this one out. Stimulates milk production in women. Has possible electrolyte uh, balance mechanisms in men. It's not produced in large quantities in men, uh, but it can cause uh, or helps to regulate uh, electrolytes in men. By the way, folks, the basic mechanisms for producing milk exist in both men and women. I mean, maybe I should say women and men. And so if men are given estrogens and progesterone and prolactin, men can produce milk. Um, so, you know, if you're really thinking about sharing child-rearing responsibilities, <laughs> you might have a discussion with your partner, right? Say, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> clear back in like the 1970s, I read an article that came out of New York. There was a, a man who uh, was married, uh, his wife was pregnant, and then he decided to undergo a sex change. He decided he didn't want to be a man anymore, so he began hormonal therapy to change into a woman, 
And when the baby was born, he wanted to share responsibilities with his, his wife. And so he received prolactin, estrogens and progesterone were already on board, and he was able to nurse his baby. Um, whatever that's worth. <laughs> yes. Also, um, women who haven't been pregnant um, can... Sometimes women who haven't been pregnant can start to produce excessive amounts of... Um, and they don't prolactin. need to have taken any special drugs or anything. Absolutely. It's just a psychosexual um, thing. Yeah, or sometimes it's actually due to a, a tumor. So. Um, this was many years ago, but I, I had a student who, after my uh, lecture, uh, came up and she said, well, I'm lactating. And I said, well, how old is your baby? And she said, I don't have a baby. And I said, well, you know, you really should go talk to an endocrinologist. So she went to an endocrinologist, referred her to a neurosurgeon, uh, a really neurologist, and they uh, did a CAT scan. And they found that she actually had a tumor, uh, had a tumor in her pituitary gland. Uh, and so it was actually when she was living in Salinas and they said we'd like to do surgery and remove that tumor. And she came back and asked me and I said, well, how many surgeries have they done? And she said, well, they both said that they have assisted but never actually done the surgery. I said, this is not a good idea. And so I actually had read an article of an endocrinologist and a neurosurgeon at UCSF that had done thousands of the surgeries I told her, why don't you go up and talk to him at UCSF? I saw her the next semester. She looked completely different. Her skin had cleared up. She just really looked like a different person. She said, I went to, to, up to UCSF. They did the surgery. She said she felt much, much better. By the way, when they do these surgeries, folks, think about where the pituitary gland is located. I mean, just for a second, all right? Remember where your pituitary is? It sits in the cella tercica of the sphenoid. Would you like someone coming down from the top to get down to your pituitary? Not a good idea. So this is done either up through the gums or up through the nose, and then they use fiber optics to locate the tumor. Uh, what, what percentage of frontline have a tumor there? And they said it's not so uh, her symptoms were that she was lactating, and she also had horrible complexion. Yeah, she did. Uh, somatotropin, growth hormone, okay? Somatotropin, also called growth hormone, so hormone that feeds the soma, right? That feeds the, the soma. So most of this, uh, the highest levels of this hormone are released uh, during adolescence, uh, but as an adult, you continue to produce growth hormone. It's critical for normal uh, replacement of tissues, so ma maintenance and, and replacement of, of tissues, you're still producing growth hormone. Uh, a few obvious abnormalities of, of growth hormone, gigantism. Yeah. So uh, we have some modern giants that you see on television, right? So. Uh, Richard Keel, been around for a while. Andre the Giant, now dead, but was in uh, Princess Bride, right? Yeah, a little time over spring break. Watch Princess Bride, it's a pretty funny movie. Uh, and you get to see Andre the Giant. Uh, tallest man on record, uh, eight foot 11 inches. How tall are your tallest basketball players, folks? Seven, seven. Seven, one, seven, two, seven, three. Seven, three. Eight foot eleven. We're talking two feet taller than the highest, highest basketball player. I went over a major one time. It was somewhere like at the bottom of that chart. Uh, huge, right? Huge. So we call this gigantism, right? If you develop a tumor in the anterior pituitary, in the area that produces somatotropin, and you are still in your growing phase, so that you have not formed your epiphyseal lines you can grow to be a giant, right? So these people grow very, very tall. Uh, it can be treated. So as I was just talking a minute ago, they can locate the tumor and then go up and, and remove the tumor. I remember reading a story, oh, this is, gosh, 20 years ago. With the fall of the Soviet Union, they had a young man uh, in the former Soviet Union that uh, he was like 10 or 11 years old. He was already like six foot eight. Uh, and so his parents brought him to the United States to the Mayo Clinic so that he could have surgery and have the, the tumor removed. I was reading that and I said, you know, 
11 years old, maybe six foot eight. Can you imagine telling him to go to his room? Go to your room. No. Uh, uh, so gigantism, uh, an obvious abnormality. Uh, a condition called acromegaly. And acromegaly. So if you develop a tumor in the anterior pituitary and produce large amounts of growth hormone, but your epiphyseal lines have already formed, you cannot continue to grow your long bones. So we call this condition acromegaly, and um, here's a, a uh, series of pictures showing a woman developing acromegaly over time. So normal uh, young girl, normal age 16, but certainly we can see here uh, very abnormal in, in appearance. So I don't see what's abnormal about her. Well, take a look at her nose, take a look at her, her uh, mandible, uh, certainly you can see it here as well, uh, the forehead, and then they're trying to show she has incredibly large hands. Uh, so if you have excessive amounts of growth hormone, the tissues that can grow will grow. Your hands will grow, your feet will grow, the nose will grow, the jaw will grow, the ears will grow. Uh, the frontal bone enlarges, right, and you, you see this, these characteristic changes. Yes? So this is after the epiphyseal lines form? If the epiphyseal lines are formed. Uh, again, if they can catch this early, they can remove the tumor. If you look at, at giants that have gigantism, they also have acromegaly. I mean, let's go back. Look, look at the picture of Richard Keel, right? You see, look at his jaw. Look at the nose, look at the frontal lobes, and of course, you know, gigantic hands. So uh, once he got through growing, he, they didn't remove the tumor, he developed acromegaly. In a sense, we all kind of develop a little acromegaly. So if you go visit a uh, convalescent hospital and you're visiting older people, have you ever noticed, looked at their ears? Uh, maybe you've noticed their noses. Take a look at their hands. We continue to produce growth, produce growth hormone as we age, folks. And so your nose is still growing. If you think it's big now, stick around 40 years. <laughs> your ears are still growing. Your mandible's still growing. Your feet and, and hands are growing. Again, not to the extent that somebody that really has acromegaly. <clears throat> yes? Your nose is hard to uh, it, it is, and it's stimulated. So growth hormone doesn't affect just bones. It stimulates normal tissues, including skeletal muscle and cartilage, tendons and ligaments. Could they use it to like, help somebody who had like, a cartilage? So, uh, can they use it to help people with cartilage abnormalities? I don't know, but I can tell you that it is a drug that is being abused by athletes uh, because they know that they can get larger, not just if, if they haven't formed their epiphyseal lines, not just bigger, taller, but they can increase muscle growth uh, and, and, and strength. Uh, so it's, it's being abused by athletes. Uh, a uh, Oakland Raider player that probably nobody knows named Lyle Azedo uh, died of a uh, brain tumor and he had been taking growth hormone. Uh, he also was taking uh, anabolic steroids, but he really felt that the growth hormone had contributed to his uh, tumor. Because uh, you're stimulating all tissues to, to grow. Um, was when, you know, this was, gosh, research is probably at least 20 years old. Uh, they found that if you give growth hormone to geriatric patients, you'll increase their muscle mass, you increase the uh, elasticity of their skin, uh, general well being tends to increase as well, they feel better. Uh, so bone mass, muscle mass increases, skin seems to make some changes, and of course once they discovered this, you had lots of geriatric patients saying, mm, I volunteer, right, I'd like to have that, that hormone. Uh, on the other hand, you're going to tend to develop acromegaly and right, possible right, any tumors that may be available. There really is a, a, a lot easier way to increase muscle mass and bone mass, folks. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> right? 
uh, but people would rather take an injection than have to actually go and, and, and exercise. Uh, well, what about the opposite of excessive amounts of, of uh, growth hormone dwarfism? It turns out there are numerous causes of dwarfism, right? There's cartilaginous abnormalities, bone abnormalities, there's all kinds of things. But if we just think for a minute about abnormalities due to not enough growth hormone being released, uh, that's what we're talking about here. So we're talking about pituitary dwarfism, uh, where you end up, right, with people that, that don't grow. And so this actually is not a Photoshop or picture. All right, so here's a, a uh, dwarf. Uh, if you don't produce adequate amounts of growth hormone, you're unable to grow. Right? You won't grow normally. Um, for many years, once they diagnosed a child that had uh, deficiencies in growth hormone, they would go and collect the pituitary glands from cadavers and collect the growth hormone from that and inject it into the children to help them grow. Uh, it turns out growth hormone's species specific, right? So you couldn't get it from cows or pork. Uh, they stopped doing that, oh, it's been a good 20, 25 years ago, because uh, what they started to see many years later, 15, 20 years later, is that some of these now grown up children that had received growth hormone developed uh, a disease that, that, I'll give you the, the real name for it, uh, you call it mad cow disease. It's actually in humans called Kruzfeld Jacobs disease. You don't need to know that. Uh, but they were developing this this mad cow disease where there were prions uh, developing in the brain and causing holes to form, literally holes in the, the brain. So they quit giving the, that, uh, the cadaver uh, derived uh, growth hormone. Luckily, not long after that, Genentech, which we've talked about before, isolated the gene for human growth hormone and was able to insert that into bacteria and get bacteria to produce the growth hormone. So that uh, we have available now uh, somatotropin growth hormone, human uh, growth hormone, and that's what's being abused by athletes as well. Yes? Um, so you said that growth hormone is species specific. Yes. Why is there a big deal with cows, for example, that have been treated by growth hormone? You have a really good question, right? People are really concerned that it may have some other effect but it's species specific, right? So they're worried that it's gonna cause some other changes, but it's species specific. Uh, well, so Genetech has growth hormone that's uh, available. Uh, it's a big help to help children that have not grown as they should because of a lack of, of growth hormone, uh, which is great. And actually Genetech went out and sent out clinics all, all over the place, right? Uh, and in those clinics, what they do is they go to local schools and they say, we'd like to come to the schools and help monitor the growth of the children so that if the children are not growing fast enough, we could counsel the parents and help them by offering them uh, human growth hormone. Sounds like a great public service, which it is, except not only did they offer growth hormone to kids that didn't receive adequate amounts of growth hormone, they offered it to kids that were just going to be short not because of a lack of growth hormone. Uh, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, our culture is, has a bias against short people. If you are tall, you will make more money than if you're short. And that is after they take into account athletes. They take the athletes out. Taller people make more money than short people. Uh, and so they have gone to people and say, would you like your child to grow? Maybe they said, you know, oh, this kid's gonna, this man's gonna end up only being five foot five. Would you like him to be taller? You know, that's a pretty tough question for parents. It's been a while since I checked, but last time I did check, uh, the cost, it has to be done by injection, uh, the cost was about $50,000 per inch. Okay? <laughs> so you could, as a parent, you could have all kinds of guilt with that. Right? <laughs> Uh, I actually had a student, one of my former students, who uh, came up to me and said, you know, this very thing happened to me. They've offered to have my son. He's only going to be five foot four. They said they could make him grow taller. What do you think? And I thought for a minute, I said, you know, I come from a really short family. You wouldn't know that to look at me. 
but my mother was 5'2", my father 5'5". Five five. I have a sister who's 4'11", a brother that's 5'2", and a brother that's 5'3". So I just push them out away at the dinner table. <laughs> uh, and they're all very successful. All right, so my, I told you, my youngest brother's a four-time Olympian in Greco-Roman wrestling. My other brother's an attorney. My uh, sister, now retired, used to run a women's clinic in Denver. Uh, you don't have to be tall to be successful, uh, but it does play on parents' guilt, right, when they, they come to uh, and offer this. Yes? Short people live longer. Short people live longer. There you go, right? Uh, 